Chapter 11 Conley in School The third degree, or the school, was fruitful in Conley's case. The defense of Frank has declared that after the first day it was not a third degree that Conley went through, but a school, and the detectives, they say, were the instructors putting the words in Conley's mouth. At any rate, May 27th, Conley made another affidavit. In this statement, which was made to Scott and Chief Lanford, Conley admitted that he wrote the notes, but declared that he went to the factory Saturday afternoon and found Mr. Frank there, and the latter called him. Conley again accounted for his whereabouts in the morning, going into many details, and repeating those relative to the writing of the note which were given in the first affidavit. Conley also added the statement that while he was writing the notes, Frank walked nervously about the room, and looking up at the ceiling, exclaimed, Why should I hang? I have wealthy relatives in Brooklyn. The Negro asserted that he did not know then that Frank came to Atlanta from New York City. The detectives were satisfied with Conley's second statement until they had had plenty of time to sit down and think it over. The Negro had looked them squarely in the eye and asserted that he had told them everything he knew, even though he realized it might involve him criminally. But back at him they went again at noon of the following day. For many hours he was closeted in the office of Chief of Detectives Newport Lanford, while a dozen newspaper men who had gathered outside clamored for news about the grilling. Chief of Police Beavers was called into the conference several times, but the officials all refused to talk. By words that leaked through the doors, the reporters pieced together the Negro's new story. He had added that he had helped dispose of the body. The following day so many of the new sensations told by Conley had been gleaned by energetic reporters that Chief Lanford decided to make the Negro's third affidavit public. It follows in full. On Saturday, April 26, 1913, when I came back to the pencil factory with Mr. Frank, I waited for him downstairs like he told me, and when he whistled for me, I went upstairs, and he asked me if I wanted to make some money right quick, and I told him yes, sir, and he told me that he had picked up a girl back there and had let her fall and that her head hit against something. He didn't know what it was, and for me to move her, and I hollered and told him, the girl was dead. He told me to pick her up and bring her to the elevator. And I told him I didn't have nothing to pick her up with. And he told me to go and look by the cotton box there and get her a piece of cloth. And I got a big wide piece of cloth and come back there to the men's toilet where she was and tied her. And I taken her and brought her up there to a little dressing room carrying her on my right shoulder she got too heavy for me, and she slipped off my shoulder and fell on the floor right there at the dressing room. And I hollered for Mr. Frank to come there and help me. She was too heavy for me. And Mr. Frank come down there and told me to pick up, damn fool. And he run down there to me, and he was excited, and he picked up by the feet. Her feet and head were sticking out of the cloth. And by him being so nervous, he let her feet fall. And then we brought her up to the elevator. Mr. Frank carrying her by the feet and me by the shoulder. We brought her to the elevator. And then Mr. Frank says, Wait, let me get the key. And he went into the office, come back and unlocked the elevator door and started the elevator down. Mr. Frank turned it on himself. We went down to the basement. Mr. Frank helped me take it off the elevator and he told me, Take it back there to the sawdust pile. And I picked it up put it on my shoulder again, and Mr. Frank, he went up the ladder and watched the trap door to see if anybody was coming, and I'd taken her back there, and taken the cloth from around her, and taken her hat and shoes, which I picked up upstairs right where her body was lying, and brought them down, and untied the cloth, and brought them back, and throwed them on the trash pile in front of the furnace, and Mr. Frank was standing at the trap door. He didn't tell me where to put the thing. I laid her body down with her head toward the elevator, lying on her stomach, 
The left side of her face was on the ground. The right side of her body was up. And both arms were laying down with her body by the side of her body. Mr. Frank joined me back of the elevator, and he stepped on the elevator when it got to where it was, and he said, Gee, that was a tiresome job. And I told him his job was not as tiresome as mine was, because I had to tote her all the way from where she was lying to the dressing room in the basement from the elevator to where I left her. Then Mr. Frank hops off the elevator for it even gets even with the second floor, and he makes a stumble, and he hits the floor, and catches with both hands. And he went around to the sink to wash his hands. And I went and cut off the motor, and I stood and waited for Mr. Frank to come from around there, washing his hands. Then we went into the office, and Mr. Frank, he couldn't hardly keep still. He was all the time moving about from one office to the other. Then he come back into the stenographer's office, and come back, and told me, here come Emma Clark and Corinthia Hall. I understood him to say. And he come back and told me to come here, and he opened the wardrobe and told me to get in there. And I was so slow about going, he told me to hurry up again, damn it. And Mr. Frank, whoever that was, come into the office. They didn't stay so very long. Mr. Frank had gone about seven or eight minutes. And I was still in the wardrobe, and he never had come to let me out. And Mr. Frank come back, and I said, Goodness alive, you kept me in there a mighty long time. He said, Yes, I see I did. You are sweaty. And then me and Mr. Frank sat down in a chair. Mr. Frank then took out a cigarette, and he gave me the box, and asked me did I want to smoke. And I told him, Yes, sir. And I taken the box and taken out a cigarette, he handed me a box of matches, and I handed him the cigarette box. He told me that was all right, I could keep that. Then I told him he had some money in it, and he told me that was all right, I could keep that. Mr. Frank then asked me to write a few lines on that paper, white scratch pad he had there, and he told me what to put on there, and I asked him what he was going to do with it, and he told me to just go ahead and write. And then after I got through writing, Mr. Frank looked at it and said it was all right. Mr. Frank looked up at the top of the house and said, Why should I hang? I have wealthy people in Brooklyn. And I asked him, What about me? And he told me that that was all right about me, for me to keep my mouth shut, and he would make everything all right. Then I asked him where was the money he said he was going to give me. Mr. Frank said, Here's two hundred dollars. He handed me a big roll of greenback money. I didn't count it. I stood there a little while looking at it in my hand. And I told Mr. Frank not to take out another dollar for that watchman I owed. And he said he wouldn't. The rest is just like I told you before. The reason I have not told this before is I thought Mr. Frank would get out and help me out but it seems he is not going to get out, and I've decided to tell the whole truth about the matter. When I was looking at the money in my hand, Mr. Frank said, Let me have that, and I will make it all right with you Monday, if I live and nothing happens. And he took the money back, and I asked him if that was the way he done. And he said, He will give it back Monday. James Conley Sworn to and subscribed before me, 29th day of May, 1913. Notary Public, Fulton County, Georgia. Conley explained his presence at the factory by saying that on Friday afternoon, Frank instructed him to meet him near Montag Brothers, where he went every day, and come to the factory to do extra work. He arrived there about 11 o'clock, he told the officers, and met Mr. Frank, behind whom he walked back to the factory. Frank had then told him to wait downstairs until he was called. He waited and fell asleep, he asserted. That day at noon, Conley was carried to the pencil factory by half a dozen detectives. In their presence, and in the presence of a number of newspaper men and several of the factory employees, he dramatically reenacted his part in the crime. 
The Negro was repeatedly questioned by the detectives as he went through the factory, and he answered them rapidly, glibly, without a moment's hesitation. In pointing out the place where he found the body, where he dropped it, where he got the sacks, and other points, the Negro didn't hesitate. In half the time, the detectives had to trot to keep up with him. Following the illustrated lecture on his part in the crime, and his recitals of the conversations which he said took place between himself and Frank, he was carried to the superintendent's office, where he got into the wardrobe. Later he wrote one of the notes from dictation. There, in the presence of the newspaper men, Chief Lanford asked the Negro if he had been mistreated during his stay at headquarters, and he answered in the negative. Asked by the chief if he had been promised clemency or offered any reward for the story, he again said no. From the factory, Conley was carried not back to police headquarters, where he had remained from the time he was arrested, but to the county jail, commonly known as the Tower, where the sheriff is in charge, and the police and detectives have no authority. Visitors were allowed to see Conley whenever he did not object to their presence, and a number of reporters interviewed him. After he'd been in the Tower two days, William Smith, an attorney first employed by a newspaper to represent the Negro, but who later remained as counsel employed directly by Connolly, secured the court's agreement to return the Negro to police headquarters. The Negro charged through his attorney that friends of Frank were constantly passing by his cell, and that they had abused him, saying that he was lying, and that one had even drawn a pistol on him and threatened his life. Another, he said, had offered to get him whiskey. After Connolly was carried back to the station house, the Solicitor General made strenuous kicks about the amount of publicity given the Negro statements, and requested the detectives to keep all visitors away from his cell. There was then an order passed that barred everyone from his cell except city detectives. This meant Harry Scott, the Pinkerton, who had given such valuable aid to the police, but who frankly admitted that he was furnishing reports of all developments to his employer, the National Pencil Company. While the order did not include them, it resulted in virtually barring from his cell all policemen and detectives, except the heads of the department and Detective Starnes and Campbell, who were then working directly under the instructions of Solicitor Dorsey. From that moment, until he took the witness stand at the trial, the public heard no more from Jim Conley, and it was generally believed that he had stuck to his third story until, in reply to the solicitor's question at the trial, he commenced adding new sensations. <laughs>